Okay, we're trying something different this time. I'm not sure if this is going to work or not, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Talking about Boneyard. Uh, this is not everyone's cup of tea, I understand. This is a pretty bizarre text and can be really offensive, actually. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in the background of this text. There's trauma, there's strict religious upbringing, there's Mennonites. There's this confusing array of repeated symbols and images interspersed with incredibly upsetting imagery. Interrupted by bickering footnotes, they go out of the way to make it less possible to decipher this text. So how are we going to figure this thing out? Uh, I say we start here. Let's start thinking about the symbols as they repeat themselves and see if we can find in that a way into understanding what this text wants to do and how it wants to work. Uh, to do this, to consider these repeating symbols, it'll, make, it'll help us to make use of an, uh, an older idea in literary theory and literary analysis called the hermeneutic circle. Uh, many of you heard me talk about the hermeneutic circle before in the past, um, so we'll take a, maybe a deeper dive into this to figure out how this thing works, what it is exactly. Uh, the hermeneutic circle was an idea that uh, really took root in the early 19th century in German biblical criticism. A guy named Friedrich Schleiermacher uh, comes up with this, this method of interpreting the Bible and trying to understand how narratives operate. From there, it became an easy move to say, well, this should, in fact, apply to all forms of literature. Here's the basic premise. The symbols of a text define themselves through their use in the text, or another way to say that, uh, meaning builds through context. This is opposed to saying something like the symbols of a text or the words of a text are things that we can find definitions for beyond the text. Rather, it's an acknowledgement that meaning comes from within the context language is used. Uh, this, this sounds uh, pretty basic, right? And we all understand this to begin with. If I say something to you like, give me the thing, what am I talking about? What am I referring to? What thing am I talking about? It really depends. Am I in the kitchen? Well, give me the thing might be, give me that fire extinguisher because I'm really bad at using the stove. So help me out. Give me the thing. Now, uh, if I'm in an operating room and I say, give me the thing, you probably don't want to give me that same fire extinguisher. You might want to give me a different kind of thing. Uh, the basic premise in this whole idea is that symbols are defined in the context they're used in. This is true of all language, but it's especially true when we're dealing with a language that is imbued with additional significance, something that is already loaded with different kinds of, of meanings and ideas that carries a different sort of interpretive weight inside of a text. Uh, things like symbols. So what is a symbol? This is one of those words that uh, English teachers throw around a lot that nobody really knows what it means and so you end up hearing symbol so much that it stops meaning anything. Uh, symbols are deeply meaningful. Let's, let's try and figure out what those things are. Intuitively, we already get that though, right? So symbols uh, are when one object refers to a larger um, significance, a larger story, a larger idea that stands behind them. A rose, for example. We often think of roses as symbolizing romantic love or passion or, or something like that. Uh, another one might be the Christian cross, right? So many of us see this as, um, I don't know, a sign of Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' sacrifice, but also maybe beyond that, a sign of belonging to a larger community or, or a covenant or something along those lines. Uh, but even here, context uh, might change how that could be understood because crosses could also be about uh, uh, superstition in different contexts. Uh, in other contexts still, that could be about hatred or bigotry. So symbols are defined, even when they're big symbols like this, are defined by their context. Uh, here's what Samuel Taylor Coleridge had to say about symbols to define this term for us. A symbol is characterized by a translucence of the special and the individual, or of the general in the especial, or of the universal in the general. Above all, by the translucence of the eternal through and in the temporal. It always partakes of the reality which it renders intelligible, and while it enunciates the whole, abides itself as a living part in that unity, of which it is the representative. This idea of the translucence of the temporal through and in the temporal uh, is really the essence of what symbol is. It is the particular by which the universal can be apprehended. There's a transcendence that one grabs out of this symbol, but for all its transcendence, it never loses its eminence. It's always present with us, and from its present place can grab at that larger thing beyond itself.
Uh, the symbol is, in a way, a kind of doorway into this larger world. Uh, Coleridge's great example of the symbol was the Eucharist. This is a big symbol, right? So when we think about the Eucharist, we think about a lot of stuff. We think about remembrance, right? Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. But when we talk about remembrance, it's not just like memory, like reminiscing. The word that we're thinking there is actually anamnesis, unforgetting, removing forgetfulness. Uh, we're taking the past and we're not just sort of commemorating it. We're instead reliving it. We're reacting it out. We're revivifying the past in our present action. And what we're revivifying is not just some abstract idea. It's the body of Christ itself, right? It's the incarnation, this central idea in Christian doctrine. And not just the incarnation, but the point of the incarnation, which is the death and sacrifice of Jesus. And not just that point of the incarnation, but also the resolution of the incarnation, the resurrection. When we have the Eucharist in our hands and we hold the body of Christ, in our hand, we're actually talking about the return of the body of Christ. All of this mystery, all of this transcendence is something that we grab onto in the form of this, this symbol. But even more than that, we're participating in this with a universal church body. That's kind of a big deal. Regardless of borders, regardless of geography, regardless of time, this is something that all Christians have always done. That is a huge, huge amount of meaning, all crammed into one tiny little cracker. That's kind of a lot to think about. Freud, too, will define symbols uh, in a very similar way. What Freud is going to say about symbols is that they are the storehouse into which we pour all of our unacknowledged and unacknowledgeable fears and desires and hopes, the things that our id hides from our conscious mind as we dream get dumped into specific images so that when we find a symbol, we don't find it with just one correspondent meaning. We find it loaded with all sorts of associated meanings, all sorts of things crammed together so it's not just one simple correlation between sound, image, and, and object, not just a simple linguistic sign of signifier signified. Rather, a symbol carries with it all the emotional, affective, historical, and uh, unspeakable desires that stand behind it. So how do symbols get so loaded with meaning. This is one thing the hermeneutic circle can start to unpack for us. Uh, if we're going to grab at the transcendent, we have to figure out how this door of the symbol can begin to operate. So let's think of this uh, line as our plot line. And as we work through the plot, we're going to encounter the symbols of the text. Now again, the hermeneutic circle defines uh, the meaning of a symbol as something that accrues through its use. As it appears multiple times in a text, we're going to find this symbol gains a more robust definition. So let's just start with the first one. Here's our first mention of a symbol that we come across in a text. This is our, I don't know, chapter one, something we've come across this idea. And we find the symbol represented to us. When this symbol is represented to us, this is an important moment because it's the first time it shows up. In biblical criticism, we have a thing called the law of first mention. The first time a term shows up, the first time an idea shows up, dictates how it's going to be understood for the rest of the text. The first mention is essential, and understanding the first mention is essential for figuring out how this particular symbol is going to develop in the rest of its uses across the text. Uh, at this point, our symbol is, is pretty simplistic, though. We've only had one mention of it. It hasn't had a chance to accrue any meaning, which means it has a lot of baggage from outside the text helping us define what it is. But for the most part, it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing. We now move on to our second mention, and we see that by the time we get to the second mention, the symbol starts to look a little bit different. It's not quite the same. In fact, we can now think about the association of these two things alongside each other. The hermeneutic circle gives us the opportunity now to think about what has changed in these two representations. We now have not just one symbol, but two symbols. And by looking at their likeness and their unlikeness, we begin to see a new meaning that appears out of them. This, by the way, is a definition of metaphor. The close association of two unlike things used to bring about a new understanding through their juxtaposition. We can now can understand these two symbolic representations, or these two mentions of the same symbol, uh, giving us maybe a new or more complicated idea of what a symbol can be. Well, we continue our way on through the text and we begin to find that we have all these different mentions. Now, these are all the same symbol, but every time the symbol appears, it appears a little bit differently. And in that difference, we can continue through this process of, of metaphor to see how the changes are beginning to nuance what our symbol starts to look like.
By the end of the text, we find ourselves with a far more complicated symbol, much more complex. Now here's the real innovation of the hermeneutic circle, because it's not the hermeneutic line, it's the hermeneutic circle. This is why we return at the end. And the idea is, now that I've gone through this whole process of meaning-making, of metaphor, of juxtaposition, of refining and nuancing and reshaping my definition of the symbol, when I return to that first mention, it's not just the square anymore, it's not just that simple four-sided symbol, but now it carries with it all the baggage of my previous reading. When I go back to that first symbol again, my first mention is now informed by the development of that symbol across the entire text. But because of that, and because of the law of first mention, now every symbol that follows subsequently also gets further refinement, gets further shape added to it. The metaphor becomes richer and becomes deeper, so by the time I end again, my symbols become way more complicated. This is how a complex symbol can be made through the, accru the accrual of meaning across a text as we build meaning through the repeated use of symbols. Uh, what Schleiermacher gives us is maybe a little bit different than that also, because he points out it's not quite a true circle when we have the hermeneutic circle. It actually looks a little bit less like a circle uh, and a little bit more like a spiral. And what we find in this, in the hermeneutic spiral, is every time I have a new symbol showing up, uh, it's not laying directly on top of the other, but rather uh, through a kind of parallax shift we see it's building meaning across subsequent readings. I never actually return to the beginning of a text. There is no uh, going back. You know, history is a one-way street. I can't go and repeat things again. Uh, and because of that, I find that this meaning process is something that occurs across a historical span as well. All right. So the complicated symbols that we get in a text, we can also find in something like Boneyard. The red door is a perfect example of this. The red door, one of those things that appears over and over and over again in the text and gives us something like uh, desire, but also gives us something like fear and also gives us something like the outside world beyond uh, the, the Amish town that young Jake Yoder is in. So uh, ideally, if the hermeneutic circle were, were to help us out any, we could find the repetitions of this symbol, the red door, and every time it repeats, we hope we could find some deeper meaning. The problem is, of course, that Beachy doesn't give us that straightforward understanding of his symbols. In fact, he disrupts that whole idea of the law of first mention by giving us the most complex and complicated idea of his symbol to start with. The hope, though, is that we can use that circle still to look at that complicated symbol as it appears first and through a method of stripping away or decomposition or deconstruction, pull things back to that most simple way of understanding the thing. That is to say, what we get from Beachy is not a true representation of the hermeneutic circle. Rather, what we get is a parody of the hermeneutic circle. Parody is a really important idea for this text because ultimately, at the end of the day, this text is deeply, deeply postmodern. And parody is one of the key motivations or one of the key uh, tools used by postmodernists. The postmodern context in the background of Boneyard doesn't just deconstruct the hermeneutic circle or uh, replace the hermeneutic circle with a kind of parody. It also goes on to deconstruct or challenge the other modes we use to make sense of a literary text. Uh, first and foremost, in understanding who the author is. Here's just the first page from the very beginning. We find a complication of those basic orders of making sense in a text. Beachy writes, first of all, a note from the author uh, with, with uh, scare quotes around it to help us question whether or not the author is something we can actually trust for this. Although my name is on the cover of this book, this book's actual author is a boy. I'll call him Jake Yoder, although this isn't his real name. Uh, we don't even have a full sentence yet for this text, and already we have a complete uh, confusion of who is in control of the text. Is the author Stephen Beachy? Is the author Jake Yoder? Jake Yoder doesn't exist. He's not even a real person, ultimately, character for this text. Which means what we have is a, a sort of a collaboration between two people. We have the quote-unquote author, Stephen Beachy, whose name is on the cover of the text, but who is not the real author. And we have the real author, Jake Yoder, who's not a real person. So we have uh, a fake author with a real name and a real author with a fake name. 
Ultimately, this raises questions about uh, how much of the text belongs to each person, what it means to collaborate on a written text, who uh, wrote what parts. There are places in which Beachy suggests 50%, and places in which he suggests a 60-40 split. You can find at the end of the text, when we get there next week, that there's an appendix that includes the burned out pages from uh, Jake Yoder's original, uh, trying to figure out what uh, could be salvageable from that kind of burned out apparatus. And why would we need the apparatus at the end? Why would it need to be given to us? By the way, it really is written by Jake Yoder, sort of what, what Beachy's trying to say. Uh, such a strange setup to begin with, the real author versus the fake author. But that uh, upsetting kind of relationship, or that relationship that's designed to upset our faith in the author, gets even further complicated with a third figure, the editor, Judith Owsley Brown, uh, or J.O.B. as she appears in the footnotes often. Now, uh, J.O.B. and Stephen Beachy will go on to have a kind of duel in the footnotes between each other, kind of argument. Uh, footnotes, of course, are traditionally meant to be the thing that is used to make sense of confusing parts of the text. And what we find in Boneyard is that the footnotes further complicate the text by asking us to either question the sanity of the author or to question the validity of the footnotes. The footnotes become sort of self-subverting in the text. Uh, let me show you what I mean We see it with uh, the, the opening uh, note from the editor from J.O.B. herself. She says, One could say that it is in the spirit of the original Enlightenment project to shine light upon the darker corners of the human mind so as to better understand ourselves and to therefore forge a more benevolent social order that I humbly present the text that follows. So uh, J.O.B. here is telling us that the reason why she's giving us this text is not because it's worth reading, but because it's a kind of psychological experiment. Uh, she ties herself directly to the Enlightenment, to modernity, saying that her goal is to probe the dark corners of the human mind. Uh, this establishes the voice of J.O.B. as being essentially the voice of reason. We might look back at that model that has uh, the, the, the fake author, Stephen Beachy, the real author, Jake Yoder, and now this additional uh, uh, oversight by an editor as a kind of a Freudian nexus of, of the I being the, the, the author, Stephen Beachy, the id being the sort of foundational text, uh, Jake Yoder, and the superego being, being uh, J.O.B. That might be too simplistic a framework for this, and certainly something that J.O.B. would embrace, but Stephen Beachy would not. Uh, ultimately, all that is to say, what we get out of J.O.B. is this deeply entrenched enlightenment thought. She is deeply, deeply modern. Uh, of course, we find Stephen Beachy uh, responding directly to her. Uh, often in the footnotes, uh, he says, discerning and attentive readers, which of course is the phrase that J.O.B. had been using uh, to call readers out to pay attention to how uh, uh, unbelievable Beachy's reader might, Beachy's uh, narrator might be. Uh, Beachy says, discerning and attentive readers, if not you obtuse and willfully naive readers, will have figured out by now that Judith is not so subtly suggesting that I'm mentally ill. In far, she's trying to turn revelations uh, the revelations about the nature of my mental illness into a kind of narrative hook. Maybe she'll be able, maybe she'll, oh, brother, maybe she'll label me a male hysteric. Clearly, Judith needs to pathologize what she doesn't understand. So this is here now, uh, Beachy deconstructing that uh, rationalist um, uh, idea of, of J.O.B. that all things can be made sense of and the things we can't make sense of it's because they must be crazy. Well here's the thing that I can't make sense of therefore must be insane. Uh, now now Beachy sort of calling attention to the apparatus of sense making itself to deconstruct that. Uh, J.O.B. begins her footnote on the second book in a very similar kind of way. She says, I would argue that rational discourse is the only foundation of a liberal society and our only bastion against the forces of chaos. Uh, now this sounds very familiar. We've read things like uh, Jürgen Habermas and Charles Taylor at the beginning of the semester. This idea that rational discourse is a, a central part of democracy. Uh, to take that sort of a step further, we should ask, what is exactly, what counts as rational? This is what Habermas's question is. Why have we decided that religious doesn't count as a kind of rational part of discourse? Uh, the Enlightenment ideal that would divide religious from secular would say that secular language is rational and religious language is irrational. So here, uh, J.O.B. is relying on this older idea of liberal society that works directly on an Enlightenment model, to which she will also uh, critique. 
whatever Judith, he says directly to her, <laughs> addressing her directly, whatever Judith, I guess you assume your readers are not so attentive or discerning that they can figure out your obvious implication. Your legalistic view on ethical issues is horrifying, uh, calling direct attention to this uh, Enlightenment ideal of hers. So not only do we have this kind of uh, uh, interaction then between uh, Stephen Beachy, the author, and now Judith Olsley Brown, the editor, this sort of fight for who gets to control the rational level of this text. Uh, but we have to think about it in terms of what happens with this other character, Jake Yoder. But we also can't forget that really all of this stuff uh, is a large apparatus written by actual author, actual Stephen Beachy. Uh, whatever we get in this fictionalized version of the author Stephen Beachy, we can't say is definitely the actual author Stephen Beachy. In the same way that Jake Yoder, who actually doesn't really exist as a made-up character, uh, is being ventriloquized by Stephen Beachy. The same thing with Judith Olsley Brown. There is no such person. It's a construction of the author. So all three of these figures emerge as kinds of literary characters that are pretending to be non-literary characters. All of them are in some sense pretending to be real. This begins to deconstruct construct that boundary between what we call real and what we call fictional. One of the things postmodernity wants to do is to remind us that what we've called reality is itself a narrative construction. And as a narrative construction, it is no different than a work of fiction. Uh, speaking of the author directly, though, Beachy wants to go even further and deconstruct the author as uh, the means by which we can bring meaning to a text. He says this uh, in the footnote uh, in uh, chapter 5. He says, Judith's obsession with authorial biography and an outdated concept of psychology as a source for ultimate literary truth, however, is exactly the sort of approach that has distorted literary life into just another aspect of our celebrity-driven culture. Uh, this idea here, right, as a source for ultimate literary truth truth. That was the modern idea. What is the true or the proper or the correct interpretation of the text? Uh, Beachy wants to get rid of that altogether. Uh, she's using, Judith is using, authorial biography, and now Beachy wants to deconstruct what the author is. Does this. Judith might want to consider the ways uh, Michel Foucault, who used to cruise the gay bathhouses in San Francisco, examined the consequences of the author's existence within a property-based system in his essay, What is an Author? This is a very famous essay from Foucault uh, and often used in postmodern criticism to reconsider uh, what the author has to do with the text that they produce. Foucault writes, Texts, books, and discourses really begin to have authors other than mythic sacralized and sacralizing figures, to the extent that authors became subject to punishment, that is, to the extent that discourse could be transgressive. He continues, also, we are used to thinking that the author is so different from all other men and so transcendent with regard to all languages that as soon as he speaks, meaning begins to proliferate, to proliferate indefinitely. The truth is quite the contrary. The author is not an indefinite source of signification which fills a work. The author does not precede the works. He is a certain functional principle by which, in our culture, one limits, excludes, and chooses. In short, by which one impedes the free circulation, the free manipulation, the free composition, decomposition, and recomposition of a figure. Now, uh, Foucault's point here is not to say that texts didn't have authors before modernity, but rather to say that in modernity we come to understand the author in a very different way. Uh, our understanding of authorship really emerges out of the need to blame someone for the subversive work that a work of literature can do. Uh, because it works against these figures of authority, these structures of power, we have to find someone to blame. Who is at fault? For this literary work. And that's where the idea of the author comes from. That also is where the idea of intent, what is the intent of the author, that's where that comes from. Uh, what we want to do then is not think about what the intent of the author is, but part of what is implied with that intent of the author is to say that uh, the author speaks meaningfully and has the meaning sort of kept in his pocket. If only we can get to it, he'll give it to us. Foucault here is trying to deconstruct that as the way by which we make sense. Beachy's use of it is a little bit different. He wants to undermine the author entirely as something that could be an anchor for meaning in a text. He wants to say that the author's life, the author's background, the author's uh, mentality, his mental state or mental illness ultimately have nothing to do with how a text functions. It gets a little bit more 
complicated when we start thinking about the ways that this text overlays real life and what we can do with the author function uh, in real life. Now, once again, postmodernity wants to deconstruct that boundary between what we call real and what we call fictional, or I should say the narrative by which we understand real as something we've pretended to be unconstructed and discovered and, and merely natural, and the things which we know to be fictional. The goal in postmodernity is to remind us that those things that appear to us as natural are equally constructed. So, uh, for example, we have our real fake author, Jake Yoder, who has a real actual Facebook page. You can go on Facebook and add Jake Yoder. Uh, it's really there. So this fictional character, uh, who doesn't have a real name, actually has his own Facebook page. On the other hand, the author, Stephen Beachy, uh, actually made his, his literary career early on writing about this other figure, J.T. Leroy. J.T. Leroy. J.T. Uh, stands for... Jeremiah Terminator Leroy. J.T. Leroy in the early 2000s was this really influential literary figure, a literary celebrity, really. Uh, Best-selling author, writing from this position of being a, a dejected youth, so oftentimes would put um, sort of uh, parallels of himself into his text. So all of his main characters would really closely his own life, his own faults, his own traumas, his own uh, uh, positionality, right? That sounds real familiar because we've just come off the back of Juno Diaz. Uh, J.T. Leroy used to give uh, these, these literary events where he'd go and get interviewed and he'd go and uh, uh, talk to people and it's really mysterious. You can see the picture of him here. He's got the, the long blonde hair and the sunglasses on. Uh, well, it, 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 it turns out uh, J.T. Leroy is not a real person. J.T. Leroy is a fabrication, is a pen name of this other author, Laura Albert. Uh, and anytime J.T. Leroy would make a, a personal, professional appearance, it was a hired actor. This whole idea of literary celebrity was purely constructed, this concoction of this great literary figure. And Stephen Beachy, the author of Boneyard, was the person who exposed J.T. Leroy. The person who exposed this, this, this author creating a fake author for the text, and an author that looks a lot like Jake Yoder. So this uh, idea that the real Stephen Beachy, the actual Stephen Beachy outside of the text, uh, is somehow also a real figure it can become complicated as well. Uh, what we find out then are these, these different characters turn out all to ultimately be just other expressions of author Stephen Beachy, but an author Stephen Beachy who may not even be there himself at the end of the day. Uh, this is not, though, I, I want to be very clear about this, this is not like an absurdist approach to meaning making. The absurdists would say there is no truth. The only truth is that there is no truth. And uh, uh, all pursuit for truth is, is ultimately nihilistic. Uh, this is not that absurd is bent. Rather, this is postmodern. This is reminding us that there are multiple competing avenues for truth-telling. Each one of these avenues has an angle. Each one is a construction, and each one has limitations. The problem is modernity has obscured that from us, has made us believe that, uh, that these things are not all equally constructions, that some are, quote, real and some are fictional. Uh, this, is not, this is to break down that distinction and to say that truth is merely another fiction. It's a game that we can choose to participate in. Part Okay, so if we can't rely on the authority of the author to make sense of this text for us, how are we going to put this whole thing back together? What are we going to do to make sense of this thing? This is where I think the hermeneutic circle can come back into play for us. Remember, the hermeneutic circle asked us to consider the meaning of a text being produced from within its own context, which means we don't need to go outside to finding out who the author is or finding out the life of the author or any of that other stuff to make sense of it. At the same time, we have to recognize that the hermeneutic circle itself is one of those enlightenment sense-making projects that this book wants to highlight as a construction, but then also give us the tools to deconstruct. Let's see how this might work. Uh, what if we put together a mind map? Uh, a mind map would be a process by which we pull out the repeating symbols 
consider what goes into their meetings and try to find the connections between them. The more we can find these associations, the more robust we can make our metaphorical read of what these symbols are doing. Let's take, for example, Beth. This is one of the main characters that shows up a few times again in the text uh, that, that recurs, and every time she recurs, she has a little bit of a difference to her. Uh, seeing those differences will be important. It also you know, bears mentioning that uh, the text itself notes that Beth may not be a real person. Uh, she certainly has a fluid gender. She has a different representation every time. She has a different relation to Jake or to the narrator every time. So thinking about all of those things together, it will help us to think of Beth as being uh, a symbol more than she is a character. Let's consider some of her features. She's described as having luminous hair. Uh, she's, she's Jake's crush, so that means she's an object of desire. She's something that, that Jake, Jake wants. Uh, but also, every time he uh, expresses desire for her, it leads him into a trap. So the first time we find him uh, trapped by his language arts teacher when he's being molested by his teacher. It's because he was following Beth, and he said Beth is in the back room behind the red door. Uh, and that's what's kept Jake there. At the same time, he seems to recognize and realize almost immediately that that's a lie. It's not really true. He's sort of deluding himself into thinking Beth is back there uh, when, when she's really not. Um, She's good at spelling, just like Jake is. So there's a sort of doubling that happens with her. Both, uh, you know, Jake's, Jake's being good at spelling is what is uh, leading to his ability to write these stories. So he's done his spelling homework, and now he can go work on writing. Well, she's good at spelling, too. Like Jake, she's Amish. We find one description of her uh, in the basement. There's a photograph of her uh, in a basement next to a bunch of trash and evangelical literature, it says, wearing an Amish bonnet. Right? So she's dressed as an Amish girl. She is indecipherable, or she writes indecipherably. There's the time when she's uh, living in the barn, and he finds her with all the chalkboards around her that uh, are being uh, rewritten and palimpsestically sort of erased. Uh, but then also, uh, later on in the text, she writes letters, and those letters are themselves um, coded uh, to, to their recipients. Uh, she is the narrator's twin, as well, right? So uh, uh, there's another story in which Beth and the narrator are sort of twin brother and sister. Uh, she is the girl on the train that goes on a journey, just like the narrator does, but she's also often referred to as sister, uh, but also sister in this very Amish kind of way, right? That uh, not sister biologically, but sister in the sense that every female is sister and every male is brother. Uh, when she goes to deliver, she says, is it a sister or a brother rather than a boy or a girl? Uh, so she's a sister. She is in search of her own twin, though. So not only does she sort of serve as the symbolic mirror of the narrator, she also has a twin of her own. This is why she goes on that journey to find her twin. If she finds her, the twin is a hermaphrodite. Uh, in Beth's version of the story, the twin is not just a hermaphrodite, but also this very bizarre creature with a, a large head that crawls around on her elbows. And very uh, strange description. She also gets associated with Jake's mother uh, oftentimes. So she delivers the golden baby after swallowing the golden tooth, right? She's protecting all those eggs. Uh, she drowns in the lake like Jake's mother does. She's seduced by an outsider like Jake's mother was. So in many ways she is mirroring not just Jake's object of desire, but also Jake's mother. Uh, okay, so that's Beth, but Beth isn't the only symbol that we have. We also have, for example, Darlene. Uh, Darlene, of course, is the substitute teacher that takes the place of the language arts teacher, but she's not as much fun as the language arts teacher. She's uh, a little more of a stickler for the rules, a little more uptight. Uh, she also shows up as a cop later on. She shows up as a psych nurse later on. So uh, each time we're finding Darlene, we're seeing her in a position of authority, a position of control, a position of, of lawmaking. Uh, she's often paired with Luann. Luann is the social worker, but uh, Luann also shows up in all these different capacities as well. So she's the full-time teacher that replaces Darlene, who steps in as a substitute teacher. She uh, is the, the social worker that's paired with the psych nurse. So she's sort of like the, um, I don't know, the, the good cop to Darlene's bad cop. She's like the uh, 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 mirror image or the obverse image of Darlene, where Darlene is rule and law, Luann is a little bit more gracious and motherly, uh, but still quite a bit distant. Uh, Darlene is also a therapist, so brother goes to visit a therapist, and that therapist is Darlene. He then recommends her to uh, Beth, his sister, 
uh, who uh, also goes to visit Darlene. Beth loves Darlene uh, and, and enjoys talking with her. Um, she's also an actual therapist. So in the long note at the end of chapter five, where uh, J.O.B. goes to great lengths to describe this whole framework for the story, she mentions that Darlene, uh, Bruno Strauss, is actually Stephen Beachy's therapist. So she's a real, a real person. Uh, not only that, her dissertation frames the narrative. So uh, the whole uh, organizational structure this long footnote dictates for us by giving us this huge summary of all the chapters and then saying this maps perfectly onto the first section, this first book of Boneyard. There's eight chapters. They all sort of thematically line up uh, almost as if you can lay the two on top of each other and see the, 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 the repeated ideas come across it which means that Darlene in this case is serving as the structure behind the narrative. So this like ultimate layer of sense making, this, this uh, even more distant framework that the text has to be understood through. Uh, for all of these reasons, Darlene is a symbol of authority. Uh, she is the sense-making apparatus of the text, whether that's as therapist Darlene or as substitute teacher Darlene or as cop Darlene. Um, she is all about order and organization. We find this repeated with this character. Uh, and in many ways, then, she's also J.O.B.'s double. So if J.O.B. is going to be the, the voice in the footnotes that's attempting to give us a framework to understand this for, it's a very sort of Darlene-ish thing to do. Of course, these aren't the only two symbols in the text. Uh, there's also the red door that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this red door that represents um, desire, but also fear. This red door that at some point comes to represent the outside world, so that which is on the other side of Amish culture that, uh, uh, th that Beth wants to run through and find uh, wh what's out there beyond, um, beyond Amishness. It's also the paper boys, kind of like an ideal for adolescent masculinity, ideal boyhood, but also it's kind of like graduating into, into adulthood because you have your own job and you have freedom, you can, you can journey, you can travel. Uh, but there's also danger in that because the first paper boys we run into are, are people like Johnny G, who's been butchered. Uh, we have the tutor, right? Sort of like a, a subversion of the um, the male teacher. Uh, again, another kind of object of desire, but appears as almost a twin to the narrator. Journeying is a constant thing that we have Beth and we have Jake and we have really everyone sort of working through what it is to journey. Uh, the golden child, the crushed sullen boy, twins, the language arts teacher, the kid with the oddly shaped head, the river, the angel on a rack, rock stardom. I mean, all of these symbols show up in every chapter and every story repeat themselves. And as they repeat, they gain further nuance. They become more sharpened and more highlighted. And if we really want to make sense of what's going on in this text, we should do a thorough map of each one of these things as they appear. What exactly is it about these things? How are they taking shape? And how are their meanings beginning to emerge based on those repeated instances, those metaphorical overlaps between each instance? Once we've identified all of these different uh, symbols, now we can start thinking about the connection between the symbols as we have them. Right? Not only do we understand what they mean, now we can see how they associate with one another. Uh, for example, Beth um, connects to the golden child. She's sort of the, the mother of the golden child. Also associates with the language arts teacher, right? because she's trapped in the language arts teacher's back bedroom. She's also affiliated with twins. Uh, she has her own twin she goes in search of, as I had said, but also she's kind of uh, um, connected to a, a doubling of the, the narrator. There's lots of twins. The Crushed Sullen Boy is another one of the twins. Uh, he's twins with the oddly shaped head kid and the Golden Child, who are also both twins. But because they're both twins, I guess they're also uh, associated with each other. Uh, they're all paper boys. The Crushed Sullen Boy, the oddly shaped head kid, the Tutor, the Golden Child, right? Uh, these are all sort of the ideal uh, uh, adolescent, uh, but they also, they go journeying because that's what, what paper boys do. Uh, but Beth also goes journeying. Remember, she goes in search of her twin. She's on the train and all of that. Uh, rock stars go journeying. That's kind of the appeal of rock stars. The language arts teacher also goes journeying, right? This is what uh, makes him uh, leave Jake alone in his house. Um, the language arts teacher, because of his journeying, then sort of opens the door for Darlene to show up. So Darlene becomes part of this, this whole thing. Um, 
The language arts teacher also is related to the idea of the red door, right? The first time we see the red door is in the language arts teacher's house. Uh, and Beth is supposed to be behind the red door, I guess. Uh, the red door also connects up to Darlene, because remember Darlene said that to Jake that when she was the therapist, don't worry about the red door, it's not something to worry about. Uh, on the other hand, Darlene, the uh, uh, teacher, is the one that started the whole idea of rock stardom, that gave the assignment to pretend to be a rock star. It sort of spurs the whole second half of the book. Um, the, look, the, once we start drawing more of these connections, though, we find that there's really kind of uh, too many to trace. It, it gets really convoluted really, really quickly. Uh, eventually, we end up with a really complex, hard-to-decipher symbol. Uh, I know it all sounds crazy when you start doing it like this. It starts to look a little nuts. But really, uh, madness is a key aspect of this text. When we think about what this text wants to do uh, to, to make a parody out of our ability to make sense of things, that's what we should expect to find when we deploy something like the hermeneutic circle. And that's really important too, because what we should definitely, or maybe I should say, what postmodernity asks us to consider is to withhold uh, collapsing new information into a framework that we're already familiar with. If we want to grow, if we want to develop, if we want to change, we have to avoid um, letting things fall into things that are familiar or frameworks that are familiar. One of the things the text repeats over and over and over again, it appears in a few chapters, is this line, it is so painful to change, it requires a monstrous act of will akin to going mad. Part of what this text wants to give us, I think, is uh, a, a, maybe a, I don't know, a courage to go mad or a desire to think beyond the frameworks that we have or to think outside of those frameworks that we have to resist letting things resolve and things that sound, um, I don't know, normal to us. Uh, this also, I think, is where uh, we, we might let trauma theory step in and take over a little bit and think about how trauma can begin to articulate what happens on the other side of sense-making, how trauma and trauma theory really develop as part of um, an attempt to reconcile the self to the thing that happens with the interruption of self. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to go read the, the stuff on trauma theory that's up uh, and uh, watch those videos that have been linked uh, and to read through uh, Kathy Carruth as well.